Thank you for having me here today. I'm Dr. Lynn Jackson. I'm a social psychologist and I study issues related to diversity and I work here at King's University College in London. So I was asked to speak about racism, systemic racism, and implicit bias. I'm happy to do so, although they're difficult topics to consider. Uh, understanding them, of course, can help point to constructive solutions. So let's start with racism. Racism is a system of inequality between groups. So I'm talking about groups at a broad level, um, people of different ethnic backgrounds, national backgrounds, genders, and so on. Of course, there's wide variability within every group. But racism exists when people of different backgrounds have, on average, different levels of access to good things like education, healthcare, wealth, and also different levels of exposure to bad things like discrimination or poverty. So there are different types of racism and we can think of at least four types of racism. Interpersonal racism involves day-to-day -day interactions between individuals. So it occurs when members of socially dominant or majority groups treat individuals from other groups in a way that diminishes or harms them. It can be as subtle as a person avoiding eye contact with a person who's of a different background or as severe as a police officer using force against a person when they perceive a threat that doesn't really exist. Institutional racism results from policies, practices, and procedures in institutions such as in schools, in healthcare system, and law enforcement that marginalize some groups. So for example, if an employer does not allow employees some degree of flexibility in terms of when they take breaks or when they take holidays, that can, this can marginalize and disadvantage people from minority groups who may not be able to practice their cultural or religious traditions. Structural racism results from laws, policies, and practices in society that produce lasting group-based inequalities. So structural racism is evident in many ways in Canada's relationship with Indigenous people. The laws, policies, and practices that supported the residential school system have caused lasting intergenerational trauma uh, for Indigenous survivors and their families. This has lasted across several generations, which tends to perpetuate the systemic inequality between Indigenous and other Canadians. Cultural racism is the individual and institutional expression of the presumed superiority of one cultural heritage over another. So one of the reasons that educators today are working hard to decolonize the education system and to include perspectives and material from various different cultural perspectives is that in Canada, the educational system has tended to draw very much on a European and Eurocentric lens, uh, and that is a form of cultural racism. Bias is different from racism in that bias is the more psychological part of the problem. So bias is rooted in attitudes and beliefs held by individuals about other people. So there are two broad categories of the kinds of attitudes and beliefs that we're talking about, explicit and implicit. So explicit attitudes are attitudes that we hold and we know that we hold them. So they're conscious. Um, for example, those of us who are here today may share an explicit attitude that diversity is valuable and interesting. Um, and we may share an interest in learning about different cultures. Negative beliefs can be explicit as well. Um, so for example, if, if people believe unfair stereotypes about groups um, and they're aware of that belief, then that would be considered an explicit stereotype. Implicit attitudes are a little bit different. They're implicit, we have implicit attitudes or beliefs that people are either unable or unwilling to report. So they involve reactions to other people that we have and we experience, but we don't fully recognize or understand them or we don't want to admit them to ourselves. So you can think of them as sort of unconscious attitudes.
Consider an interaction between two people in which there's a, a bit of an argument. And the argument becomes more heated, and at one point in the argument, one person pushes the other. Well, how do you understand that? Um, how do you interpret the push? Was it aggressive, or was the person just excited? If you think it was aggressive, was it a little bit aggressive or quite aggressive? You know, just how bad was it? Um, research shows that when people interpret ambiguous behaviors like that, when there are different ways of understanding the behavior, People sometimes interpret behaviors through the lens of a stereotype. So for example, if the person who does the pushing is part of a group who is stereotyped in society as being aggressive, then members of majority groups will often see that behavior as more aggressive compared to when they see the identical behavior performed by somebody who's part of their own group or a group that isn't stereotyped as aggressive. And this can occur even among people who consciously reject stereotypes and think that those stereotypes are not true. So this is what we mean by implicit bias. That was an example of implicit stereotyping. Okay, so implicit bias occurs when people respond to others in a way that shows that they, in some way, psychologically associate more good things with one group than another. And bias can occur even among people who have positive, explicit attitudes. Explicit attitudes are improving faster than implicit attitudes are. So researchers are able to measure both explicit and implicit attitudes. And they have tracked the attitudes of thousands of people in North America over several decades. And the good news is that both explicit and implicit attitudes among majority groups toward minorities are consistently becoming better over time. But the difficult news is that Explicit attitudes are improving more quickly, and implicit attitudes are lagging behind. So many implicit biases are persisting. So this is a real challenge because it means that many people have very positive explicit attitudes, but may still hold implicit biases. Structural racism and implicit bias work together in a cycle. One reinforces the other. So it's when we live in a society where structural racism exists, that is, groups have unequal access to status and power, that people tend to develop implicit biases. But implicit bias also reinforces and recreates systemic racism, because when individuals hold implicit bias, they treat others differently, that can involve discrimination, and that reinforces inequality. So we can see this cycle in a variety of contexts, how implicit bias and structural racism work together. Researchers have measured levels of implicit bias in many professionals, people like teachers and doctors and others, and observed how they work with their teachers and their patients and other clients. So in the education system, researchers have shown, for example, that among teachers who have higher levels of implicit bias, they tend to show more signs of anxiety when they're teaching students from a diverse background. When their teachers are anxious, that negatively impacts the quality of their teaching. And that means then that students are more likely to struggle and that can negatively impact their grades in school, their scores. Because this tends to occur when teachers from a majority background are teaching students of a minority background, it is students from minority backgrounds who are disproportionately negatively impacted by that dynamic. And so then that tends to create the cycle where teachers can see some students struggling, don't understand that it comes from their own bias, and that can reinforce their bias. A similar dynamic occurs in the medical system. Researchers have shown that implicit bias among doctors negatively impacts the quality of education between the doctor and the patient. And that quality of interaction is a determining factor in whether patients receive appropriate medical care, such as referrals to specialists. So that 
can feed into health disparities between groups, which is part of systemic racism. So these are difficult dynamics to consider, but it is helpful to remember that Struct structural inequality and implicit bias work together in a cycle because that gives us clues as to various ways we can work on making positive change. So people often think it's helpful to start with attitudes and, and help change people's attitudes and that will help to create a more fair society. And that's a great thing to do and we can certainly do it. There are lots of things individuals can do to help change implicit bias. Um, a simple thing is to make a commitment to seek out opportunities for contact with people of different backgrounds. When individuals do that, we know that over time that helps to reduce any implicit biases that they have. And when we, so then they will be less likely to discriminate and that reduces racism. We can also look at the cycle from the other direction and try to challenge structural racism in order to improve people's attitudes. For example, one way we can do that is to think about the cultural racism in the education system that I mentioned earlier. If teachers teach their lessons, history and so on, from the perspective of all groups in their community, then all students will feel equally included and that creates an environment where every student can thrive. Students in the class who see everyone thriving will then be in a position to challenge any biases that they have. So by changing the environment, we change the attitudes. Thank you very much.